everybody. Welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast, Q&A edition. I'm here with my amazing, wonderful, beautiful, and <sighs> jacked co-host, wow. Ashley Van Hunt. <laughs> we, can we stop right there? Quit while we're ahead? That made my day. Okay, good. We're done. It's over. <laughs> It's funny, though, because I actually, first of all, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here, as I always am. But you may, I don't know if you've seen because you're in beautiful Columbia and have better things to do than be on social media. But I did just post in my stories today, just some sort of gratitude about working with you on this podcast, co-hosting with you, and how unique I think it is that, not that we're the only people doing this, but that we're co-hosting and it's two different people, different genders. That's where I'm getting at. We've got a guy and a girl coming at the same topic from different sort of perspectives and angles. And it's more unique than probably it should be, right? Like I listen to a lot of fitness podcasts and I listen to ones where it's just two or three dudes talking about lifting, where it's women talking about women's health. And it seems like it's so much more rare to have just a guy and a girl talking about these subjects. Like it has to be gendered for some reason. Like here's the girl podcast about health and here's the dude podcast about health. And I just, I appreciate so much that we can kind of open it up and include everybody, I think, in these conversations. Anyway, so that's my kind of rant of the day, but I just, I'm happy to be here and I'm glad that we're doing this. Ash, I'm super grateful to have you, honestly. And that was really Mm -hmm. kind of the intention, right? Is is I hate the idea and you, you know me by now is I hate the idea of being dogmatic and people just tend to get in, stuck in these camps of like, the, you know, we have to stick with all the guys and we're all going to do these meathead lifting or, or we're all going to do powerlifting or we're all going to do bodybuilding or we're all going to be in this very, very specific camp. And I think that's useful. I think that could be useful to kind of take one path and run with it. But, you know, my evolution has been, hey, I've been there and I've done that. And I was dogmatic mm-hmm. about things for a long time. And now you realize that's not what people need. Like people need to have yeah. knowledge and a skill set to make their own decisions. And they don't need a dogmatic cheerleader telling them, hey, look at me, follow me. This is the way to go. They need somebody going, hey, man, in amidst all this bullshit that exists in the world, here's how to make decisions based on how you feel right now and what your goal is right now. And I think that's why you and I are a great compliment because you're not overly dogmatic about anything. And I certainly try to not be. And we just kind of give the the science, we give some opinions and we just provide entertainment value. Yeah. You're the funny one. I'm the like strictly business guy. No, but I mean, also like realistically, we all love to consume content that is in line with our current values and goals and what we're into, but nobody learns when you're only surrounding yourself with people who are exactly like you. It's ridiculous to do that. I get that it's comfortable, but you talk about this all the time, that it's important to be out of your comfort zone and to push yourself and challenge yourself. And it just seems silly to only kind of keep trying to double down on the things you already think you know. Like, let's open it up to to new opinions and new experiences and different perspectives. Like, that's how you learn and grow. So, I mean, anyway. Yeah, I heard a really good story this morning about perspective on adversity, right? And we all face adversity in varying degrees. And some people have faced really, really bad stuff and stuff that some of us can't even fathom. And you know, again, it comes back to Viktor Frankl, and that's just the best book. It's like, it's always, always, always your choice. And sometimes even in your darkest hour, when you think the world is against you, maybe you should attempt or focus on seeing how much stronger you're going to come out on the other side. I have people that message me all the time that say, man, like I'm really struggling right now and your words are encouraging me. And that's why I'm here is because I've been through some dark shit and I was blessed as a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old to have some really challenging encounters, some really challenging life experiences that allowed me to stand there uh, unshaken and go, okay, I got this. You know, at the time I didn't know, but you know how much it would make me resilient to the, the challenges in the world. And I don't claim to be the strongest guy. There's certainly people out there have been through things that are much harder than me, but I think that's what allows me to give perspective. And, and so rather than crumbling under hard situations, we welcome them. And Um, You know, Mm -hmm. life shouldn't be easy. Like the worst fucking thing in the world you want is for life to be easy. And people always crave, oh, I I want these stresses to go away. No, you don't. You want to get better. You know, Jim Rohn, which is probably my earliest mentors in this space, said, never ask for life to be easier. Ask for yourself to be better. And that to me just resonated in my head and is honestly a perfect segue into what we're going to talk about today because that quote itself and the discovery of Jim Rome came from the man mm-hmm. that we're going to talk about today and, you know, my first yeah. mentor. Yeah, month. that's what we talked about offline. I said, I'd love for you to talk more about this first mentor that you had. You posted about it on social media because it's the first I've seen of him. And I actually went down a little rabbit hole and did some researching once I saw that you posted it. But And this goes along too with one of the 
success principles that you talk about that I wanted you to talk about more, which is the importance of hiring a coach, whether it's in life or for a specific goal. But yeah, tell us a little bit about who this guy is. So yeah, um, 27 years old, I was an aspiring uh, bodybuilder. Hadn't got, actually, I just got my pro card. So maybe it was even before 27, it was probably 25. And I was an aspiring bodybuilder and had no idea. Like you don't know what you don't know, right? You, I just figured like, hey, all I do is eat, sleep and train just like most young bodybuilders. And I found this guy, literally, I feel like he was an angel to me because I found him by accident. I, I went to him for manual therapy. He was an osteopath. And you know, I'd go to him because he made my, my knees feel better. He made my shoulder feel better, my elbows or something. And he, he was an amazing manual therapist. But the side benefit that I received and what ended up really making me go back time and time again and driving for an hour every, you know, once or twice a week was uh, the talks we had. And he started getting in my head about you know, how to become a better man and how to become a leader. And, and how that started for me and him was you know, he'd ask me how my week was. And I would go in and I'd complain. I'd complain about my girlfriend at the time. I'd complain about my dad. I'd complain about you know, whatever at the hell I was complaining about, but those two stand out in my mind. And, you know, there's two scenarios that he really, really mentored me on that kind of started off our relationship was, you know, this girl that I was with at the time was a massive stress to me. Like she caused a lot of issues for me. She was a wonderful person, but at the time brought me a lot of stress. And, you know, I played a victim. I, I was like, you know, blaming her and saying she's this and she's that. And he just would every single time check me on my words and on my choice of victim language and just being a victim. So there's two things that he did in that situation. Every time I would walk into his office, he would always stop me and check me on the words that came out of my mouth. I have to, I can't, things like this, right? Or, you know, just ultimately framing myself as a victim. And anytime the situation with this girl came up, he said, hey man, so why are you choosing to be there? Why did you choose to bring this into your life? What do you need to know? And at the time, I was like, what the hell is this guy talking about? It's out of his mind. And then he just started to kind of slowly, I guess, indoctrinate my unconscious mind into this reality and you know, kind of steering me down the path of understanding that I created this stuff. I chose to bring these things into my life because there's something that I needed to learn. I choose these victim words and allow myself to be the victim. So Alvin Brown is the guy we're talking about, and he's a amazing, wonderful man out of Canada who is now just finally starting to come online and grow his online coaching. You know, up to now, he's got four kids. He's got two successful businesses. He's got a wife of now, gosh, I think 30 years, maybe longer. They, they've been get together since they were 14, and he's never had anybody else. <laughs> well, yeah. that's a whole other topic yeah. of conversation. So, well, listen, so I value that stuff, right? I value people who have integrity and say, like, you know, the conversation we have all the time has been cheating is easy. Cheating is easy, man. Like it doesn't take a strong man to go out and pick up some girl and have sex with her. That's easy. What's hard is being faithful to the person that you made a commitment to. So that's hard. So if you want to be a strong man, you be faithful to that person you made a commitment to. And that's powerful to me. And he always hit home in my heart. And that's why him and I get along, we got along really well. It's like, hey man, if you make a commitment, no matter what it is, you fucking follow through. And it, even if you don't want to, and I say this to everyone who starts coaching with me, it's like, if we decide to coach for six months and you decide at three months that this isn't for you, I really don't care. Like, we're going to stay with this. I'll give you your money back, but you're going to fucking follow through in your commitment because, I mean, nobody's ever done this, but this is always the conversation. It's like, you made a commitment and to stick through this and you know, your unconscious mind knows, your character, your integrity is standing behind this. And now I've talked about this in the podcast before with you is, Integrity in life to yourself is everything, everything, everything. And I can't overstate how many times that's come back to slap me in the face and go, hey, you said this, you do this. And again, I'm still not perfect. It still like rips my heart out when I do something or when I say something and I don't follow through. But it's a massive thing. So these are the things he started to teach me. And, you know, we go in there, we spend an hour together. And it started off with three things that I want everyone to kind of acknowledge that if you don't have this in your life, find a friend, find a coach, find a mentor, because this will change your life. It's the words you use, because the words you use are a reflection of your unconscious mind. You don't think about the words you use in most cases. They become unconscious and they're a reflection of what you believe in your unconscious mind. So are you a victim or are you taking responsibility for your life? And the second one that leads in perfectly is never, ever, ever be a victim. So that means taking extreme ownership for everything in your life. I am completely responsible for everything I do. I'm completely responsible for everything I say. I'm completely responsible for my financial situation, for the way my body looks, for everything. And if you could take responsibility for that, that empowers you so, so much to take control. And if you say, oh, I'm not responsible, it's someone else's fault or, you know, I'm a victim in this uh, circumstance. 
you're backing yourself into a corner and losing all your power. You're literally handing away your power. And the third thing, so it's the words you use, the victim versus responsible, like being very responsible, taking ownership for your life. And the third one is having your growth mindset, meaning absolutely nothing in your life is fixed. You are not born with anything other than a blueprint for life. If you want to change your body, if you want to change your brain, if you want to change your business, you want to change your ability to communicate, your ability to speak, every one of those things is within your power. And that's a growth mindset. And those are the three things I think that I learned above all in the first two to three years of my relationship with Alvin. And Alvin and I have been friends for just about 20 years now, no, just about 15 years now. And we don't talk often enough because we're both busy and we're not in the same city all the time. But uh, when we do, it's like, you know, it's my brother that I haven't seen in a couple of weeks. And, and it's like, we just pick up where we left off. And there's so many lessons to be learned in there. And I can make some suggestions on the books that he suggested to me, like the early books that really shifted my psyche away from being this victim, this wandering, meandering meathead to someone who started becoming aware of everything. I have a few kind of tactical questions about coaches and mentors that I want to ask you about. But I first, I just want to double down on something you said, because I think it's so important and none of us can hear it enough. And we've talked about it on the podcast before, but it's that not allowing yourself to be a victim and what you said about how it's a lot of responsibility that you're taking on for yourself, but it's also incredibly empowering and freeing to know that you have the choice to be a victim or not. And I was listening to another podcast with a different bodybuilder. She was talking about her experiences and going through professional bodybuilding. And she was saying, like, I caught myself complaining about the food that I had to eat and what I had to do to have a six pack. And then I was like, why am I being such a bitch? Like, I chose this. No one's forcing me to have a six pack. Like, what kind of person chooses to do something for themselves? Because we all know bodybuilding is a pretty, you know, it's a selfish sport in a lot of ways. And then you complain about having to do it. I mean, it's silly. So I think just checking yourself daily. And that's another one of your principles, I think was like this kind of constant check in with yourself. Like, how are you talking to yourself? How are you talking to other people? What are your goals? And if your goals change, and you don't want to do this anymore, that's not the same as giving up. But you need to just constantly be aware that you have a choice every day to do the thing you said you were going to do or not, you have to live with it. You know, if you do or you don't, I think that's really important to just, yeah. You know, when I say like you have to see if there, it's absolutely always okay to make a lateral shift, right? It's always like, well, I don't really want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. We can go this direction and do something different, but you're still going to pursue some goal voraciously. So one thing I want to ask you, Ash, is how do you feel about women uh, enabling each other? And again, well, I'm going to speak, I'm going to ask you this question a little like specifically. I see this a lot and it actually drives me crazy where women enable each other to be victims. And it drives me absolutely insane. And then it's it's like this woman's empowerment or, or they frame it as this woman's empowerment thing. Like, but it's completely just enabling a victim's mentality. And I don't want to come across like a, like a insensitive person, but I see it all the time. And I'm just like, how can you not see this? Yeah. Like you're just enabling the victim attitude and the victim mentality, but they think it's an empowerment thing. And yeah. I know you're bright enough to see that. And how do you mm-hmm. feel about that? Yeah. I mean, I think this is like a big topic for sure. And I mean, I think that in the context of like the greater culture that we're dealing with right now, which is very hypersensitive and hyperpolitical and sort of everybody has to take a stance on everything rather than sometimes maybe just kind of observing and taking things in and moving on. We all feel like we kind of have to have our say or have our two cents or express our feelings about every single thing that happens, which hasn't always been the case in history. And so, of course, as a woman, I feel like there are certain elements to this new kind of cultural shift that are positive for women in a way where they feel like they can express their emotions and express how they feel about things that they perceive as injustice and all of that stuff. And I think everyone should feel like they have a voice, no matter who you are or where you come from. I, like similar to you, and I don't think this is necessarily gendered, I grew up being taught and not necessarily explicitly taught, but taught through my experiences that you have to take care of yourself and that no one else is really going to do it for you ultimately. And so you have to be able to, you know, pull up your own bootstraps and like be competent and be able to stand up for yourself and take care of yourself. So I've never bought into that whole victim thing. And I think we've had this conversation too. It may almost be like sort of a character flaw on my part that I feel like any kind of admission of weakness or like something's wrong or like I need help with something I perceive as weakness and I'm extra sensitive to it because I'm a woman and I feel like people are going to be quick to perceive me as weak if I let my guard down at all. So I'm almost on the opposite side of this kind of whole debate. But I will say for my part, rather than trying to get like too deeply enmeshed in it and get into the politics and 
all the sensitivities around it. What I tend to do is when I'm dealing with women in my personal life, and that can be women who are reaching out to me on social media, asking questions about being intimidated to go to the gym, or people are kind of treating them badly in this situation or that situation, or when I have girlfriends who are struggling with things. I kind of just talk to them the way you talk to me and the way you talk to your community and your listeners. And instead of sort of encouraging any kind of negativity or victim mindset, you just immediately go to where they have choice, where they have power, what they can do to move on from whatever is happening. And just what are the next steps? Like, let's be logical. Let's be tactical. What's your bullshit situation? Okay. Instead of just kind of being mired down in that, let's look at how we get out of it. And so that's kind of my personal approach. Like I think it's easy to be roll your eyes and be irritated by what we're seeing on social media or whatever. And it's just like, just do what you can with your immediate community and just try to preach the positivity and the, you know, common sense that you feel, you know? Yeah. With respect to this whole like helping each other and coaching thing, I think the biggest thing that I wish someone would have slapped me in the face for when I was starting this and probably when I was a kid is the biggest thing holding you back from progressing is what you think you know. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very hard as a human being to empower another human being, whether it be a coach or a mentor or a friend, with complete authority to tell you that you're being an idiot. So here's an example. <laughs> like when I was coming up through bodybuilding, you know, I put on a decent amount of muscle in my early career or my early years. And then I had this guy come through and, and he said, hey, man, why don't you try it this way? And I knew he was right, but I was so attached to – what I, what had got me there, that it was very hard for me to let go of what I had done to get there. So I didn't, and it took me exponentially longer to get a result. Whereas if you, you know, same thing in any type of coaching, right? If you're doing something that's kind of already working, you're not really sure, like to give somebody else enough power and trust to take their word and actually run with it wholeheartedly is really, really challenging because there's potentially a lot of downside, potentially a lot of pain, but that's exactly the very thing holding you back. So when I started working with Alvin, if I would have just listened to everything he said and did it and went all in, I would be exponentially further ahead in my life than I am right now, but I, I didn't. And you know, for whatever reason, that was my path and I had a lot to learn and I did and I've been through some challenges because of it. But you know, that's my advice to people is like, if you find someone that you trust and you find someone that you know this person has your best interest at heart, commit full fledge, like wholeheartedly get into it. So there's a flip side to this. Many of the people that listen to this podcast are coaches. We have a lot of people who are interested in growing their online business, people who are coaching people in the gym, people who are life coaches, et cetera. So as a coach, the first thing that you must do is let your client know that you care about them. You have no ulterior motive. You have no other vested interest. The only thing I want is for you to succeed. And it has to come from an altruistic place, a selfless place of like a sincere desire to help. And that's what I do with my clients. And that's why my clients have such great buy-in is because they know I have no ulterior motive. If I tell you something, it's because I care about your best interest. And that's the hardest thing for any coach to do because most people come into a coaching and client relationship and the client senses some type of insecurity in the coach or they sense some type of ulterior motive and like, ah, I don't know if this guy knows what he's talking about. I don't know if this girl knows if she has my best interest at heart. If you have that, you might as well end the relationship. You have to find someone who you know without a shadow of a doubt is completely invested in your success. And if you do, you're going to win and you're going to win fast and big, provided the person who you trust is actually, you know, has your best interest at heart and knows what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. So there's two sides to that coin, right? It's just buying in. Like if you're going to invest in somebody, you must believe that they have your best interest at heart. And if you're a coach, that must be your first intent. Like forget about all the X's and L's and all the tactics of coaching, getting physique changes, getting business growth. It's all fucking nonsense. I mean, it's useful, but it's not the first step. The first step is always getting people to know you and trust you. And there's a great book on this topic for anyone who's a coach out there. It's called Trillion Dollar Coach by Eric Schwartz from Google. It's about his mentor who really shifted his life and Steve Jobs' life. He was the mentor to both of those two guys. And I guess his name is Bill or something is escaping me right now. But that would be a great book to read. And I really got a lot of that book. And the reason they said Bill was such a big influence on their life is because he was able to say absolutely anything to them, including you know extreme cuss words and all these things that nobody else would ever say in, in a boardroom at Google or Apple. But Bill would walk in and, and say whatever he wanted because everyone knew that he had every single person's best interest at heart. So he could say anything to you, like, why are you being such an idiot? Stop being an asshole, whatever. Like, get your head out of your ass. 
and literally these are like quotes from the book. And then he would say, here's what you need to do next and take that action. And everyone did. And that's why everyone succeeded. And they literally credit this guy for you know a huge part of their success. And I'm not saying everyone needs to be able to use cuss words, but I'm saying the reason he was able to do that stuff and say the things that he needed to say without any negative tension is because he actually cared for these people. That's a huge, huge part of coaching. And that's why another reason why I loved Alvin, because this guy, he had no reason to lead me astray. He had no reason to tell me anything other than the truth. And I saw his success and I wanted to model his success in business and a relationship and just as a human being, like I love people who are grounded. And by grounded, I mean, they're not fluctuating. Like, you know, you're great for this ashes. Like you're not an overly emotional person, meaning like if something pisses you off, you're going to show it, but you're not going to fly off the handle or if there's you know, maybe so- under emotional in some cases, or which not. is a whole well, relationship issue that we could talk about in another right, podcast. But, but anyway, yes. Yeah. But consistency, yeah. right? Consistency. Mm-hmm. Like I value that so much because I grew up with mm-hmm. the opposite, right? I grew up with people who are just volatile and I hate volatility. Like, hey, we're yeah. going to be really, really happy one minute and then the next minute we're going to be off the chains crazy. And that you talk yeah. about m- me being sometimes too serious and stoic, but that's what I value in a human being. I value consistency, mm-hmm. right? I want yeah. you to be uh, predictable and I can depend on you and you have integrity. And like, that's the shit that I value in a human being. And I think that may be the most important human characteristic to me. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing more stressful than not knowing what you're going to get with somebody who you've invested in strongly, whether it's a relationship or a family member or a coach or anybody. Yeah, that's awful. I want to ask you a question, though, about I'd like you to talk about the differences and maybe the similarities, whatever, between a coach and a mentor, because those are two possibly different relationships that can accomplish different things. And I know that you've been that both of those to people and you've had both of those. So can we talk a little bit about sort of the the differences and maybe somebody who's looking for something? and they're not sure who or what, which avenue they should go down, you know, if you could kind of get into that. So I think coach is very tactical. I think it's very much like X's and O's. Like, you know, I speak that and that's very American football kind of terminology. It's like, we're going to go up there. We're going to tell you how to get from point A to point B. You want to take your business from 100,000 to a million? Here's how to do it. We're going to build a funnel. We're going to acquire leads. We're going to do sales. Like it's very, very tactical. There's no emotion. There's no life coaching. There's no mentorship, leadership, anything like that. It's just like, here's the tactics to go. That's a coach, right? I believe that's, it's very tactical. And a mentor is someone who you want to emulate, someone who, you know, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to take you under my wing and teach you everything I know about life, about finances, about relationships, about business, and just becoming not only you know a successful business person or having a successful body, but ultimately loving your life. And I think that's how I view a mentor is someone who I aspire to be more like in some aspect of life. I had a great call with my mentor last night and uh, my current mentor. And you know, again, I don't even know if he knows I'd call him my mentor, but he is. And um, I mean, anytime I need anything thought through, he's my guy. I'm like, I'm going to get a phone with this guy. Like, hey, man, I need to talk about this. You know, like, how do I kind of negotiate my way through this? And, and what I value in him is this stoic, logical, look at everything from all sides perspective. Never just like, we're going to rush into something. There's no emotion. Like, I tend to get excited about things. Like, I want to work fast in this business. I'm going to push hard on this. I'm going to jump on this. I'm going to invest my money there. And he goes, whoa, 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 hang on. Let's talk about this. Why? how, who, right? And right, he's asking all these questions. And then at the end of it, we have all of the answers and we've looked at it from all possible sides. And that to me as a mentor is someone I know I can rely on to be there for me, to guide me on the hard decisions in life. That's a mentor. And that's my meaning. Mm-hmm. It seems like also, again, just from a strategic standpoint, in many cases, this isn't across the board, but a coach is, again, somebody that's a more transactional, sometimes like you're paying for them to coach you for a specific goal, usually, whereas a mentor may be a more like informal, like a mentorship for maybe career or life or whatever, but it tends to be maybe a little bit less transactional sometimes. Is that- maybe. Yeah, I still pay for mentorship, right? Like that to me is the most valuable thing in the world. Like if I like... At the end of the day, who gives a shit if you make a $100 million business if you're still an asshole and you hate yourself, right? If you hate your life. Like, well, it's true, right? That's ultimately- That's a good quote. Yeah. Well, <laughs> put that one on a That's t-shirt. A but it is, yep. right? Like ultimately, I know many people who are, have multi-hundred million dollars and they say, Benny, you know, like my good friends call me Benny. They said, Benny, I would change- lives with you in a second. And I go, dude, I wouldn't change lives with you and for anything, like for any amount of money, because, you know, they got to this point and they've created the stress and these anxieties and these emotional states and these dependencies and just this life that needs to be kind of broken back down and built back up from the ground up. And uh, I think there's a lot to be learned there. And this is really where I am in my life is, you know, laying these solid foundations of honesty, of integrity and uh, caring and love in my life. 
in building things on top of that, right? So what I don't want is to make money from a place of dishonesty and, and lack of integrity and conniving and you know ultimately not a win-win for everybody. I never want to do that. So if I can do things that are great that come from this solid foundation, I know for the rest of my life, I have a settled heart and a settled mind. And that to me is way more valuable than any amount of money. Do you have any suggestions? And I have some thoughts about this myself, but I know you get asked multiple times a day about mentorship. And if you're, you know, and I know you've kind of done some of this work and you're working on a program, but if someone's looking to enlist a mentor, and maybe this is not, because a lot of them, again, you're not necessarily paying for them. Sometimes you are, sometimes it's a transactional thing, like you're going to offer some value to them and they're going to offer some value back to you. But what are some recommendations you have for somebody who's listening, who wants a mentor, whether it's you or anybody else, how they should go about seeking one out, approaching one, how they should, you know, kind of frame the relationship, like just kind of any kind of pragmatic steps. Yeah, one of the hardest things I've ever done, Ash, is making a 25-year vista. So rather than a, you know, a plan, like people say, I'm gonna set 25 year goals. What, well, I don't know what the hell that looks like, but it's like 25-year vista, which is like the big picture, long-term view, right? What does my life look like in 25 years? What does your funeral look like, right? What are people saying at your funeral when you die? Who's at your funeral? What are they saying? Things like that. You know, not that it's 25 years and the, the death of the same thing, but looking at like these far end-term goals and going, okay. Who do I want to be? How do I want to have impacted the world? And how do I want to be remembered? And looking at it from that perspective and literally creating a list of all those things that may exist in that context is really, really useful for how to guide your life, right? So people set these goals like, hey, I want to make a million bucks. Why? Right? Why do I want to make a million bucks? Well, because I think it's going to make me happier. It's going to give me, you know, this and this and this. It's fucking not. It's just like butt muscle, right? The thing that I've learned with muscle is you can build all the muscle in the world. It doesn't change who you are. So don't set the goal to build the muscle. Set the goal for what it makes of you to become it. And that's another Jim Rohn quote, another one of our 44 success principles. So that's a big thing with this mentorship thing is so once you've decided who you want to be and what it is that you want to be said about you, you know, at your funeral or in, in your 25 years when, you know, 25 years is this interesting place because by that point, hopefully you've made enough money and you're set for life. Let's say hypothetically, you're set for life. How do you want to be remembered or what do you want to be doing when money's no longer an object? And You have all the money you need. What are you doing? What gives you joy? What brings you fulfillment? How do you want to be impacting the world? So once you determine those things, it becomes a little bit more self-evident who you're trying to become and who would be an appropriate mentor. And there's a particular blind spot or a weakness that you're harboring that would be probably the best place for you to start looking for a mentor, right? Like if I'm really bad at finances, go find a financial mentor, right? If I'm really bad at physique stuff, go find a physique mentor. If I'm really bad at business or if I'm really bad at relationships or then you could have 10 mentors, right? At the end of the day, you could have mentors in different areas. Ideally, you find one who kind of has all these different uh, skills and assets. So that's what Alvin was to me, right? I I valued every piece of his life because that's what I value as a person. That's what I want to be. I don't want to be really good at finance and shitty at my body. I don't want to be really good at a body and really shitty at my relationship. Like I want to be balanced. And so when, when I look for a mentor, that's what I look for. Does this man or woman have integrity in business and in relationships and in finance and everything, right? And so finding someone who's in alignment with your values and you know, the values is everything. So if anyone hasn't done their values yet, the value determinants, I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend you do that with Dr. John D. Martini. If you have the finances, move heaven and earth to go to one of this guy's events. I haven't yet, but I watch everything he puts out online and all my friends go to his events because I just happen to not be able to coordinate timing. But anytime I'm ever in the right place or if I can fly into the right place, I'm going to be there. He's the guy who's going to help you determine what you value and actually understand decision-making and how to progress in your life. And are you on the right path for you? It's so interesting, but that would be the guy. He's the guy in the world for value determinants, but that's how you find a mentor, Ash. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay. There's a couple of things I want to tack on to this that, again, are just very sort of like tactical, pragmatic points. And you can tell me if you agree or not. But one of them, I think, is if you are reaching out to a potential mentor, and this is going to be an informal sort of interaction. The thing that I think people need to keep in mind is, and you've said this a lot actually in the podcast and just in life, I know when we're talking offline, it's always about what you can do for other people first, right? And it's okay to want things and to want help from people and to think that in doing something good, good's going to come back to you because all of that is true in human nature. But you have to be approaching things with what value can I add to other people first? Because how many times, even in my life, people that are in my life and friends and people who are 
are mentors to other people? Have they been approached by someone who's just like, I think you're awesome. Will you mentor me? The end. Like you literally are reaching out to a stranger and asking them to do work for you. Like you have to think about what this interaction is, what you can offer to somebody so that you can get something in exchange. That's how this works. Like nobody owes you anything. I think a lot of us just are born with this like sense that like the world should give them stuff so they can be successful. Nobody owes you anything and no one has any obligation to teach you stuff just because they can. You need to come into this with a little bit of a like, you know, give and take relationship attitude. So I think the first thing that people should think of when they're going to send a cold email or a message or a DM or whatever, is think that through before you just like tell somebody like, hey, you're pretty cool. Want to mentor me? Like, come on. Are you renting because you see my inbox? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Well, yes, your inbox, but also, and so I can be rude. So you don't have to on the podcast, but not just you. Like this is something that I think is pervasive and I've had it to a lesser extent too, that people literally reach out and demand things of you because you're in a place where, and look, you've said explicitly out loud to your community that you're here to help and serve people. And that's fantastic. And I like to do that too, but there's like a reasonable limit here where it's not my job to sit and answer or your intricate DMs because you sent it to me. Like, There's got to be a little bit of understanding and respect for people's time and knowledge and expertise and that you can't yeah, you can't just like, look, if you mentored everybody who just sent you a DM was like, hey, you want to mentor me? Like, dude, you, you wouldn't be here talking on the podcast right now because you'd be fucking mentoring everyone. So anyway, I think just again, being reasonable, being thoughtful and respectful of other people's time, I think is a big sure. step. And here's the thing, like not everyone needs to be mentored by me, right? Like not everyone needs to be mentored by, you know, everyone just needs to go from point A to point B. Everyone's trying to go from point A to point Q, right? They're trying to jump their way through all these different hoops and you can't like life is a series of steps that need to be done in order. And and it's very, very challenging to bypass any of these steps. So, you know, if you're ready to have a high level mentor, then approach them in a way that's appropriate. And you'll know that by the time you are ready to take on that mentor, you know, like if I'm taking on a mentor, I'm certainly not going to approach them in a way that's anything other than, sir, I'm very grateful for your time or ma'am, I'm very grateful for your time. I'd love to hire you to do this and I'm financially capable. And, you know, I want to let them know that. And I want to, I want to make it very professional or like, you know, if I just want to hire somebody who's going to take me from, you know, this very, very minute thing, and maybe I just take like, Hey, I'd love to you know, exchange some type of service or find some way, like you say, to have a mutually beneficial relationship always. It's always got to be a win-win. Never just come with your hand out. And, you know, the millennial generation tends to get a lot of slack for that. And I don't know that it's just millennials. I think it's, you know, a lot of people in this entitled world think like, oh, you owe me something. Or, you know, it's a very materialistic world of like, you know, we're the best, we're superior and uh, you owe me something. So why don't you just do this for me? Because I asked and that's, it's such a ridiculous new world culture that frustrates the shit out of me some days. Like, you know, I get people who apply to work with me and they're like, yeah, I want to make this huge amount of money. I've never done anything before. I've got no experience and no skills, but I want them to make this huge amount of money without ever, ever improve themselves. And if it were me, like, this is how I hire people. <laughs> like they literally have like the two people who are my longest term employees literally did work without me knowing and sent it to me and go, Hey, check this out. I did this for you. I thought you'd appreciate it. I didn't ask for anything in return. And I reached out to them and said, Hey, what do you do for work? Like, would you like to come work for me? That's how shit works, right? It's like this person took the initiative to go out of their way and do something that was a massive project and took their time and their effort and their thoughtfulness and just sent it and asked for nothing in return. And then I went, literally went out of my way. I'm like, Hey, like, I'll pay you whatever you want to come work for me, right? That's the framing that ultimately we're trying to get to is like, if you want something, get, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, give, 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 ask, right? So that says jab, 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 right hook. I think it's three jabs and a right hook. Um, it's give, 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 ask. And that's it, right? So that's life. That's business. That's um, relationships. That's, you know, this is not a give, 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 take. It's give, 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 ask, right? That's business. That's relationships. That's everything. If that's a great kind of place to for people to understand how to move forward with any new relationship in life. And, you know, you may not even have to do the asking part because if you're doing all this giving, well, oftentimes people are going to, like you said, people are going to respect and appreciate what you're doing and give back without you having to ask. So that's another thing to consider. But I think the other kind of downside to this culture that you're talking about and sort of the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of coaching and mentoring and why that's important, I think that Because there's so much information out there in the world right now that's free, the idea of paying top dollar for a coach or for a program is tough for a lot of people to swallow. But I think that 
it's all about, you know, what you invest is what you get back, right? So if you expect to do your first bodybuilding show by like watching a couple people on Instagram and just kind of winging it, like the results are going to be what you would expect, right? Like you need to invest in things so that you're accountable. And especially if it's your own money, like you have somebody else paying for your competition prep, like, okay, but when you're paying for it with your own money and you've invested in this person, and you've researched this coach and you said, look, I've put the money down, I've paid for the show, like this is happening. I think that people need to be more willing to, if you've put your foot down and said, this is important to me, the investment and the money that you're putting into it should reflect that. And I think that too many of us think like, hey, we can just kind of figure it out because everything's for free and I can download a couple PDFs from the internet and like figure it out. That's not how people (laughs) become successful. Well, the reason that is, is because this influencer lifestyle that so many people lead, people get the shit thrown at them, right? And I think about that in relation to like my camps that I do all around the world that we have tons coming out early 2020, Dubai, Australia. We're doing Bali now, Ash, which is going to be fun. Um, But anyway, so people like, could I get a huge amount of exposure by inviting some big wig influencers and going, hey man, you got 10 million fans come to my camp for free in in exchange for a shout out. Yeah, great. What's going to happen? They're going to come. They're not going to respect my time. They're not going to learn anything. They're not going to appreciate my information because they haven't invested. So no matter who you are, and I'm guilty of this too, if I've ever been given anything for free, I'm much less likely to sit there and appreciate it and invest in work and actually get everything out of it. So it's almost a disservice to give somebody something for free, right? It's like this idea of, well, you know, they're just going to show up and not respect it. And I did that once. And at the end of it, I was like, man, I feel terrible about this. Like, I don't ever want to do that again. I always want to pay for anything I get. I have people, you get this. Like, I have people that reach out all the time say, hey, we want to send you free stuff. Nine times out of 10, I say, no. Like, no thanks. I can pay for it if I want it. If I want to try your product, I'll try it. And if I like it, I'll reach out to you and say, hey, I really like your product. Would you mind? Like, would you be interested in creating a relationship? But I want to try it first and I want to pay for it from my own pocket. And like, literally, there's countless sponsors who reach out and you get it. You see this. Like, hey, let's, can we send you free stuff for a shout out? I'm like, absolutely not. No interest, right? Whereas if I try it and I buy it and I like it, you know, maybe I'll reach out. And I think that's a very different, empowering place to come with the world rather than just always taking and taking and taking. And now you're you know, ultimately giving away your power because oh, I can't afford it. People are just going to send me stuff. And now you start to expect it. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Okay. So I know we have to wrap this up pretty soon, but are you going to get Alvin on the podcast? I guess I'm putting you on the spot here, but. I would like Alvin to be on the podcast every day. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hey, hey, honestly, look, we, we don't need somebody to take my job just yet. All right. Alvin can come on once. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, so honestly, like I've never met a man who's read more books, who has more experience, who just, just this wealth of information in every area. Like he's the guy who saved the relationship with my dad. I wouldn't talk to my dad right now if it wasn't for Alvin. I would never say a word to him. The day that I was going to stop talking to my dad, I went to see Alvin and I asked for his advice and Alvin took me through some stuff and I went and we've had a great relationship ever since uh, my dad and I have. And and like the guy's just absolutely amazing. And I will have him on at some point. His schedule is crazy. And if I do it, like I want him to be sitting beside me. I don't want to do it remotely. It's just too impersonal. And mm-hmm. I, I want to have him sitting beside me so I can, you know, appreciate him more than ever. Uh, but mm-hmm. yeah, it'll happen. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, I mean, enjoy Columbia. Did you bring your fresh press with you to Columbia? I forgot to ask you that. Only what, one what bottle. Only one uh, bottle. That last that lasted what? Like the trip over there on the plane? No, I'm <laughs> rationing it. So I've been here what eight nine days now, and I've got maybe like a I don't know maybe an eighth of a bottle left. Jeez, it's, it's just, what are you gonna I, do? I didn't want to bring. I didn't want to bring. I didn't want to bring six bottles. So I'm like, what yeah. do I do? Fair yeah, enough. I don't know. I'm drinking a lot of water, not eating a lot of food. And that's kind of the end of it. So <laughs> maybe right. I'll just do maybe I'll do a seven day fast when this one's done. All right. Good luck with that. I don't know. I don't know how you're gonna survive without your, you know, quart of olive oil per day, but we'll see what happens, I guess. You'll let us know. <sighs> yeah, well, it is what it is. Good luck. Thanks, Ash. I almost am out of fresh pressed, even though I do not use sixteen tablespoons per meal, but I have been literally basically just doing like a tablespoon around meals because I want to actually taste it. It tastes so good that I almost don't want to like hide it in a salad or on top of food. So I've been doing like literally health shots of this olive oil because it's that good. It's so good. And yeah, I mean, I put it on everything and I yeah. try not to put, I put a little bit of salt on it. No vinegars or in the no, no dressings or anything like that. So that. That's like my, it's my condiment. I dip my mm-hmm. meat in it. I, you know, I, I drizzle it on my eggs or my cabbage and my whatever, everything. 
Yeah. And I noticed a lot of people on social media are posting pictures of the olive oil <laughs> that they got because they did the the fancy. If you go to get Fresh 35, you can get like the full bottle, which is usually like 39 bucks. You get it for a dollar. Like it, there's literally no way you can get better quality olive oil. So, but yeah, I saw people posting it and I've seen people like people have messaged me too, because again, people think that I'm just like direct line to Ben. They're like, Hey, is Ben like cool in real life? Does he have like good calves in real life? And I'm like, no, nope, no, nope, overrated. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> No, no, I'm only nice. But yeah, people are reaching out to me and they're like, I can't believe how different this tastes from the stuff that I've been using. So I mean, like they're really, you can't overhype this stuff. Like it actually is the best quality olive oil I've ever had. No doubt. I'm not going to talk this yeah. much good stuff about something and not actually be true to my word. You know that. <laughs> Good point, BPAC. All right. So we're done here. But anybody who wants to get this before it runs out, because I think it's pretty close, actually, get Fresh 35 and get your olive oil. Do it. All right, ladies and gents, that's a wrap. Thank you guys for joining us on the Q&A today. We hope you enjoy it. We've been getting amazing feedback, Ash, and I think that's mostly to do with you. So thank you. Agreed. Yeah. And uh, everybody <laughs> have a great day. Thank you guys so much for following us on Instagram and YouTube. And you can always visit us at the new muscleintelligence.com where you can find a ton of amazing new assets for free, body part specialization guides. And we've got tons of programs uh, over there you can pick up as well. So uh, as we continue to grow the content on that site and the message, uh, we're super grateful for you guys joining us. Have a great day. Live your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.